hi, it's Mike with Utastic. I'm here at GoToCon 2015, and I'm sitting here with Trisha G, who gave a talk about leveling up your automated tests. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me. So, leveling up your automated tests, what is, can you tell us more about that? Sure. Um, so, I, that's a long story, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was about when um, I had been working at a financial exchange where we were really anal about testing. We had like tests at every single level, we did test driven development, did our tests first. Um, and um, I kind of got so used to working that way, and I worked that way for about four years, mm -hmm. that I assumed that all developers had evolved to work that way as well. And then I moved to a different project mm -hmm. where um, we did automated testing, which is a massive step up from other places I've been in the past. Um, but the automated testing was um, not as comprehensive as I would have liked to have seen. So it, the talk is really about the story of trying to go from writing tests for, to tick the box of, yeah, I wrote a test, right. to writing tests that have have value of writing tests that um, do something useful, but not in a kind of uh, you must write tests kind of way, in a kind of way where as developers we go, mm -hmm. all right, this is kind of fulfilling, if you like, or right. satisfying or fun or, or yeah. whatever. So how do we get our mind into a place where tests is not like, oh, God, I have to write a test, right, right. but like, oh, cool, I get, to, I get to experiment now, and this is where I start writing my experimental tests around the code that I've written. Yeah. And it's interesting because it, I, I just interviewed Jay Fields a few minutes ago, right. and he talked about unselfish uh, tests and uh, he talks about motivation. You know, what is your motivation for right. writing the test? And it sounds like that is something along the lines of what you're trying to figure out is actually like how do you go about evaluating what your motivation is? Right, exactly. So the, the talk is really around, um, I, I mean it's a specific journey that, that we took and a technical solution that worked for us, mm -hmm. but the, the talk, the lesson really should be the journey that we took in terms of mm -hmm. looking at what tests can do, what, what you think they do, mm -hmm. what they can give you, why why we weren't doing the best job we could have done with the tests and how we tackled each of those problems. Mm -hmm. And one of the main things is to realize that writing tests is not to check that the code that you wrote works. Mm -hmm. Writing tests is for things like checking, um, it was to give you maintainability, mm -hmm. readability, documentation. Yeah. Does um, it do what I expect it to do? Right. Does it do, yeah, does it, um, it, does it document what the system should do and, um, you know, does it, does it handle these edge cases I didn't really think of and that sort right. of thing. And, you know, the last time we spoke, you were with a different company, but now you're with JetBrains, and, and they deal with such a wide variety of tools, and they provide tools for, you know, Object C, through Java, through .NET. I mean, is that is that reflected in some of the lessons you've learned with, uh, you know, how you approach testing? Did that... Um, I mean, well, so this particular talk was based on my experiences at Mongo. Oh, okay. But um, the thing was that it was quite good. So we were heavy users of IntelliJ IDEA. Mm -hmm. And um, when we were using Spock with Groovy, which is a language which was not familiar to us, IntelliJ IDEA really helped us with that stuff because right. it kind of helped us, helped guide us towards better Groovy practices and helped us to write tests which were, um, which looked right and felt right. Um, so uh, I guess I haven't been at JetBrains long enough to oh, okay. know the impact enough yeah. of that company on the testing stuff, but I have to say that using the JetBrains tools mm -hmm. at Mongo um, really helped us write better, faster tests, and yeah. it gave us the feedback we wanted from the tests. Yeah, and going from using a tool to work at a company, I can't think of a better uh, testimony <laughs> for for how good the tools are. Right. It's like, oh, I, I use this tool, it was so good, I want to work there. Right, know? exactly, and the, the great thing about working mm -hmm. for JetBrains and the fact they make IntelliJ, so I'm kind of looking at the IntelliJ tool set, plus also a bit of TeamCity and mm -hmm. UpSource and a lot of these kind of um, uh, enterprise type tools that generally Java developers will be using um, in the real world. Um, but all the stuff that I've kind of learned as a Java developer is applicable in this role because, right. you know, I've been using this tool for a long time. I know um, that it's great for this and I know shortcuts are good for this. Right. And I know there's a lot of stuff that I didn't know and when I discovered it, I was like, oh, that's amazing. It makes my life better. Yeah. So my job now is to take all the stuff where I thought, wow, that's amazing and um, put it on videos or on small animated GIFs and show yeah. it to everyone and say, look what you can do. <laughs> yeah, so so it's it's you're getting to do a little bit more teaching yes. and, and sharing out. Yeah. So, uh, um, I just drew a blank. <laughs> it's the end of the day at, at the end of a conference. So, uh, but the the role that you're doing now is is you know, and I want to just kind of dovetail into being a developer advocate yeah. and, and and going on um, some conversations I've heard that had happened um, in Twitter that maybe uh, described that the role of developer evangelist and advocate isn't quite as well understood by the community 
as it is. Uh, can I ask you some questions about being a developer sure. advocate? What, what is it? What is that role? What is that job? Okay. Mean? So I will answer it from my point of view. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the interesting things about the developer advocate, developer evangelist, is that it depends from job to job mm-hmm. and from company to company. So um, at MongoDB, what was very important to us was as evangelists, we were um, proper developers. Mm-hmm. We worked full time normally on a uh, on a code base that um, was used. For example, in my case, it was the MongoDB Java driver, mm-hmm. uh, and we would go out and talk about MongoDB the server and the Java driver, um, and that's great. But you end up getting torn in two directions because you mm-hmm. sort of have this full time coding job, which is necessary because you need to have the um, the uh, what's the word practical. Yeah, I'm thinking in Spanish now. I don't even know Spanish. Um, you know, you need to, you need to be practical. <laughs> you, you need to be um, reputable. Um, and developers need to believe that you understand yeah. about development. But um, to be doing development, proper full-time development, and traveling, and creating content, and writing blog posts and stuff is is a lot of work. Right. So at JetBrains, my role is much more around the, like you say, the educational side of stuff. Mm-hmm. So I'm still doing coding. I'm still contributing, actually, to um, Morphia and to MongoDB, because they're open source projects. Okay. Um, I'm still writing my own projects. So here I get to write projects which um, demonstrate something in particular. Mm-hmm. So I've got a project which demonstrates Java 8 lambdas and streams with like tiny, tiny services that you might call micro-sized. <laughs> um, so I've, I've written... heard that term floating around <laughs> this conference. So I've been writing some code that demonstrate particular things. Mm-hmm. So I, I really like, well, I wanted to see um, how Java 8 works in real life. Right. So I needed a real Java 8 project, which I created. And I wanted to see how IntelliJ helps you write Java 8 code. Okay. So I created that code for that. So it kind of lets you drill into a certain sector of, of the... Right. Of, of a, of a topic. Right. Whereas and and I can continue to ma- maintain this, but I don't need to because no one else is yeah. really using it. It's kind of fulfilled a, gro- a goal. And I can now write a bunch of stuff around this. So I have a mm-hmm. talk around it, but I also can write some blog posts or I've also used it to create some screencasts to say, look, if you want to do some shortcuts in IntelliJ around creating lambdas, mm-hmm. you, you can do this. And I have real code that works yeah. to demonstrate that. So a little bit of research and experimentation that right. might not have been in uh, a job where you're like, oh, I got a deadline and I have to deliver this feature. Right. So, oh, and I also have to write a blog post. Right, exactly. It's more like, what can I write a blog post about? Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's interesting how it kind of flips out on the head. You know, is that a common thing for developer advocates across, because you said, you, you put the uh, caveat, you're describing your situation. Right, right. Um, well, how does that maybe different? I think from... some other companies put more focus on content. I mean, content mm-hmm. takes quite a long time to come up with. If I'm going to write a blog post about Java 8 features, for example, mm-hmm. that could take, I mean, it could take weeks, you know, right. to put together a good blog post. So some uh, some companies focus more on that sort of content. Um, some companies, like I say, a bit more like Mongo, you tend mm-hmm. to have a uh, like a, a proper engineering role where you also have to deliver something engineering-wise. Um, and for some companies, the developer advocate role is um, a role within marketing. Mm-hmm. And for some companies, it's a role within engineering. Um, for JetBrains, it is its own organization, which we talk to the product owners for each of the individual products because mm-hmm. we have to, and even developers for the products. So we have very close ties to the engineering team, but we're also outside of marketing, so we talk to the marketing guys too. And that's nice. That allows us to balance, because marketing and engineering are two have two differing goals, if you like, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, One slightly. is to like deliver the product, and the other is to tell a story around the product. Yeah. And um, But the, the engineering will get the product done when it's ready, yeah, yeah. and marketing deadlines are slightly different. And yeah. being sat in the middle allows us to kind of balance those things up. But we do have deadlines as well. And our deadlines aren't like... Um, your boss saying deliver this feature by X but our deadlines are for example there's going to be a new release of Upsource next week so I need to get a screencast of the new features in Upsource done okay. by the end of by yeah Tuesday next so week so you, you live a little bit closer to product cycles yeah yeah, yeah definitely versus just marketing initiatives. Right. I mean, but it, it still it t- dovetails into a marketing initiative. Right. But it's it's um, kind of once the engineering team have done what they're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And we get involved with them earlier on. So I'm using early access versions of like most of the software. Mm-hmm. So I can also, I often end up feeding back, um, uh, you know, occasional bugs come up. Yeah. Because that's the point about an early access yeah, yeah. program. You're, you're, you're pushing the boundaries. Yeah. So I'm like trying to figure out how new features work. Mm-hmm. And I'm like saying, oh, this doesn't appear to work. And often it's me going, oh, I didn't really get get the right angle 
suitable for that feature or sometimes it's like oh we haven't quite thought of that or maybe we can replace it this way <laughs> um, so I get to feed stuff back in there as well um, so that's quite cool because um, it's well I mean it's more like being a user than a developer right. but um, so I get to input a little bit into that yeah. but also being a developer you're quite sympathetic you're not like it doesn't work it's a bug <laughs> you're like yeah. um, well I'm trying to document this feature and I'm not yeah. really sure how it works and yeah. then you speak to the developers and they're like oh it should be like this and you're like okay great and then because they can explain to me what it's supposed to do yeah. and I can think how would a developer use this then I can document it or screencast yeah. it or whatever in a way which will hopefully make it usable for, for mm -hmm. future users. Okay, well thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you very much. Thanks.